Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Before I introduce today's special guest, I want to thank Renee for this really cool t-shirt and matching earrings she got me for my birthday. And thanks everyone for all the wonderful birthday wishes. This is the fourth Tuesday of the month, which means it's time for age well and move well with Eileen Kapsoftis. And today she's going to be doing part two of how to age with a strong, pain-free back. Please welcome her back to the show. It's always good to see you. You're such a popular guest because you know what? Everybody has a back and at some point, everybody has had pain in it. So it's always good to see you. You're such a popular popular guest because, sorry about that. I'm getting feedback, but now it's gone. (laughs) Yeah, got to hit the right button. Yeah, yeah. (gasps) It's always a thrill to be here. Your audience is wonderful. Uh, I know I say that every time, but it's true. They're great. And uh, I love the questions and I love the, all the wonderful kind comments and they're so thankful. It's wonderful. So I love being here. And this is this is like the icing on my cake today because I taught my live academy class this morning and then I'm hosting, I'm in the middle of hosting the um, back master class. Today was day two. And uh, we just finished that up like a half hour ago. So I'm on a roll, AJ. I'm ready to go. <laughs> nice. I'm so, hey, I heard you were in a magazine. You want to show everyone? Oh, yes. Yes. So I'm very excited. Health Science. My article is Aging Without Decline. So um, I'm hoping it's going to reach a lot of people and do a lot of good. Nice. Without decline. That would be amazing. So teach yeah. me. Yeah. How do we do it? How do we do it? Yes. Well, mostly food, right? And then a lot of good movement, the right movement. So yeah, people get the food before they get the movement, I think, for the most part. Yeah. Well, a lot of the population that I dealt with when I was in the clinic setting, none of them had the food. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a lot of a lot of people in my audience, you know, they come for weight loss or reversing, you know, a lifestyle disease, and they do pretty good with the diet, but you, it still seems so hard to get people to move their body, especially if it's they've had a lifetime of inactivity. Yeah. And I also think a lot of it is all of the, the conflicting information out there, just like about diet, right? I mean, when people say, you know, it's easier to do your taxes than to figure out how to eat healthy. That's a pretty strong statement because doing our taxes, we, we need to hire an expert, right? So um, it's it's the same thing with the movement world, the movement industry, the, the exercise industry, the fitness industry, the healthcare world. It's, I mean, there's so much conflicting information. Do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. So people are like, ah, they get paralyzed, I think. And especially if it hurts when you move, they don't move because it hurts. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. But you know, even kids don't move very much anymore. And it doesn't hurt when they move because they've gotten so used to playing inside instead of playing outside. That's for sure. And they're like this all day, right? Yeah. Well, that's the only exercise they're getting is their thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Very bad. I mean, I know my husband was just saying the other day, we saw we saw some show and it showed kids out riding on their bikes. And he said, that's great. That's, you know, I was never in the house. I was out on my bike all the time. Um, yeah. My mom, if she couldn't find me, I was, I had climbed up a tree somewhere. You know, I was always outside. Yeah. So, not- well, hopefully we'll inspire people to move more. Yes. Yes. There's a great, just a quick resource. So I don't forget. There's a great resource that the Gray Institute put out. It's called um, Free to Play. Uh, And if you look up the There's a great, just a quick resource. So I don't, uh, it's the letter F, the number two, um, and then the word play.com. I'm pretty sure that's it. If I'm wrong, I'll put it in the the notes on on your channel. But um, they they created this great website where um, they're showing kids how to move. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. And they really punched it out there when the world shut down. They wanted all these kids moving. So they really promoted it so that uh, people could get healthy movement at home. It was great. F2 play. At, um, you think it's F2 play? Because I'm looking up F2 play. And I'm yes, I think it is. I'm going to I'm, I'm trying to remember. I've got it on one of my slides somewhere. OK, um, when you get it, I'll put it in the show notes for sure. I mean, absolutely. I think people would love it and to get the kids moving. Right. So Nice. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, this so must I guess be- I should uh, get started or did absolutely. you? Absolutely. It must be quite a topic because you had to do it in two parts. Yes. Well, you know, the back is a, is, is a big topic, like you said, right? I mean, eight out of 10 people experience back pain at some point. It's pretty prevalent. So uh, let me share my screen here and everybody can see this now, right? Yes. Is that bigger? There we are. Perfect. 
All right. So um, as you said, it's part two. And I covered a little bit because I like to do a little bit of slide, a little bit of education, and then some movement training. I think it's nice to kind of break it up, right? And, um, and you know, this is one of my favorite statements is understanding authentic human function, which means the way we're designed to actually move um, leads to better training choices. We're going to exercise different if we know what that means. And we're going to end up with improved results. So, and of course, I always have to say, you know, I'm not diagnosing anyone or treating anyone. And I don't know what's going on in people's world. They could have, you know, hardware in their back. They could have had surgeries, um, could have medical issues. So please, you know, get permission if you know you should before you do any of this and never do anything that hurts. That's my mantra. If it hurts, don't do it. Um, that's, that's a big key thing to remember. So. Uh, and then this is one of my favorite questions. Uh, when you experience pain, when you're advised to do something, will this relieve the symptoms or resolve the cause of the pain? And there's a difference in it. And I went over this in part one, right? Do we want to just, you know, take a pill to get rid of the symptoms or do we want to go after the cause of the pain so that we no longer need to take a pill, right? That, that's, that's ideal. That's what we want. We want pain resolution, right? Not just relief. And I think I shared this the last time, but this was a reminder that seven out of 10 people who have low back pain, the, even the medical world says exact cause unknown. They're, they're clueless, right? So, so what I'm doing, and I'm hosting this masterclass this week, and it's not too late if people want to join me because day two is today and it is recorded so they can watch what they missed. But what I'm doing is I'm sharing the things that are mostly unknown causes of back pain but they should be known because they're not some deep, dark secret. It's just people are always thinking it's this. It's, it's a herniation or it's a rupture or it's scoliosis or it's DDD or it's osteoarthritis or it's blah, blah, blah. I don't mean to sound disrespectful, but very rarely do they have any idea of the other causes that I'm teaching this week. So, and I did teach uh, one last week and I'm going to teach <clears throat> more today. So we'll move on. So back pain. Now there's acute back pain. And that means that you had an injury. Maybe you got hit with a baseball or you had an accident. Maybe you got rear-ended when you were stopped at a red light or you had a fall, you slipped on ice or, or fell down a stair, right? So that would make sense. That's why your back hurts. And then if it doesn't go away, it becomes chronic. Now there's, you know, why doesn't it go away? Especially if things are healed. So there's a big question to ask. But there's also something called chronic acute. And chronic acute means my back started hurting me. I didn't do anything. You know, some people will say, well, I bent over to pick this up or, you know, they can relate it to an action or a task. But some people say, I have no idea. It just started hurting me and it's been nagging at me. And now I can't sit. It hurts. Or now I can't, you know, whenever I go to get up out of a chair, it hurts or it keeps me awake at night. Well, that if you can't relate it to anything specific, I call that chronic acute, which means there were some chronic underlying issues going on in your body that only just now became acutely aware, right? So it means that you've had some of those mostly unknown causes going on and you didn't know it. So, and then, so we would call that insidious onset in the medical world, which means there's no, there's no label to give it, right? So last time I was here, I talked about what you eat that causes back pain. And then, of course, I did show some movements. Um, but this time I'm going to talk about what you wear, what you do and what you don't do. So um, this this is kind of aimed at women. And you'll understand why when you see the next slide. Footwear and back pain. Now, a lot of people are unaware of this. I'll never forget a dear friend and colleague who was a strikingly beautiful woman. She worked in a hospital setting. She was one of the, the medical experts there and she wore heels. She always dressed to the nines and looked stunning. Well, she had chronic back pain and I ended up working with her. And she, after listening to me, she went from a two inch heel down to a one inch heel. Whenever she dressed, she still looked beautiful, but she was decreasing the amount of stress on her back from heels. But you can see, because it's completely altering the position of the foot, it's going to absolutely alter how your foot hits the ground, which changes everything that happens from the ground up. So it's, it's oh my gosh, I cannot even tell you how much this impacts your body 
on a physical level. And it also creates this pelvis tilt because it gives you that increased curve in the low back, which can stress and strain the structures in the back. And then here's a, a picture of a young woman who you can see the difference, right? Here she is in flat shoes, a nice healthy spinal curve, here, not very healthy at all. Look at that anterior tilt going on because of the heels. That's gonna stress and strain the structures. And then I put this picture in here just for all of us to get a smile. I don't think anybody could actually wear these, <laughs> but it sort of looks like a piece of art, right? Um, but yeah, I don't think- I, I'd wear those. those, those are gorgeous. <laughs> Aren't they gorgeous? Yeah. I don't know if your foot would fit in there though, AJ. How much yep. how much uh, planar flexion can you do, right? Yeah, I don't think I can. <laughs> yeah. And then here's the last piece on footwear and back pain, flip-flops. A lot of people wear flip-flops and, you know, we're getting in toward the summer weather now, depending on what area or region you live in in our country or in the world, wherever you're watching this from. But you can consider flip-flops kind of like the bikini of footwear, right? The problem with flip-flops is that your toes have to constantly clinch in order to keep them on or they fall off when you're stepping. So your foot muscles are working overtime. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but because of how you're having to, to alter your foot position to keep them from falling off, it's altering the natural gait. So it's changing how you walk. And because those foot muscles are working abnormally, the connective tissues on the bottom of the foot can shorten. So you can be a lot more prone for plantar fasciitis and all these other things that go on. But the biggest thing is, is how it alters the gait. So it doesn't mean you should never wear flip-flops, you know, when you go to the beach or, or you, you know, you're, you're hanging out in the sun, but to wear them all day long, especially if you're like on a shopping trip or whatever, not a good idea, okay? All right, now, what you do. Here's Schroeder, why, why does my back hurt so much, right? I mean, look at him. He's all hunched over. He's got, oh my goodness. Well, yeah, you stay like that for a few hours. What's going to happen, right? Of course, it's going to be painful after a while. And then we've got our habits. Look at the way this guy sits to work on the computer. I laugh sometimes. And my, my husband sits that way sometimes when he's watching TV. And I'm just like, doesn't that hurt? And he says, no, I'm comfortable. Um, I don't know. That would bother me. And it's not that I have any back pain, but I, I just love to have this nice upright posture. It's where I feel more comfortable. So you know, what are our habits? What are, how are we positioned all day long? Look at the difference here when you're working at the computer, you know, are you all hunched over with your head forward or are you sitting upright with a nice ergonomic setup? Now, I will tell you, it doesn't matter how good your ergonomics are. My chair here, I will very proudly say that my son spoiled me rotten and gave me this chair for Christmas. This was literally $800 when he bought it. I, I tease and say this chair should do my research for me, right? But the thing is, no matter how good it is, it's got all these bells and whistles, I can adjust it perfectly to my body. No matter what you're sitting on, I don't care what it is, eventually over time, you are gonna start to round out your lower back. Your head is gonna come forward as soon as that happens. And you're gonna be in a posture that's not healthy to be in for a prolonged period of time. Now, if you're moving in and out of it, there's no problem, right? Because now remember what I said the last time, motion's lotion. So that's that's okay. But if you're hanging out here, that's where the problems start to arise. So you really need to be getting up all the time. When I did my, my master class for the back earlier, I set my phone. And during the lecture, I literally got everybody up after 30 minutes. And we did 10 back bends and 10 chair squats, right? We had to feed Max some blood supply. But, um, but the goal is, no matter how good your ergonomics are, you still need to be getting up regularly, but you do wanna pay attention to the ergonomics. You do want your hips a little higher than your knees. You do want a nice curve in the low back so that your head is over your body and not in front of your body. Those things are all key. And then lifting, of course, if you're just bending over and you're lifting this way, this is a real risk, especially if this is heavy because of the increased fulcrum, uh, it's a physics thing, here, this person is going to be pushing through the ground with their feet and lifting more with max here, which is the power source, right? Gluteus maximus and quads. So it's going to be a much healthier lift. So these things are important. And then, of course, cell phones. Oh, my goodness. Right. We've, everybody's got their head forward, staring down at their phone. And why is this a problem? Well, your head weighs. 
it's it, it's a structure and it has weight to it. If it's where it belongs, now depending on the size of your body, it's roughly 12 pounds if it's up over your shoulders where it belongs. But put it forward and look at the amount of weight, 32 pounds, 42 pounds, that stress on those upper shoulders, those neck muscles, that not a good thing, especially if we're doing it for hours a day. So here's a great strategy. Lift the phone up. Bring the phone to you. Don't drop your head down to the phone. It's a very simple thing to do. Same if you're reading, if you like to knit, um, crochet, anything where you're sitting and you're looking down, try to have whatever it is up in front of you so your head is not like this, right? That's, that's key. All right, and then what you don't do. This is some of the biggest problems that we have. And I mean, all of these are equally important, but what you don't do, this is what I'm gonna focus on uh, for the rest of this. So I wanna show you just a little bit of anatomy here. You can see these are the outer muscles, the, the superficial muscles, and these are the deep muscles. So we've got a lot of muscles going on in the back here, right? And you can see here, this is gluteus maximus, and max is the largest, most powerful muscle in the body. Now, max has friends. He's got gluteus medius and gluteus minimus, and he's got tensor fascia latte and iliotibial band um, and hamstrings. So he's got a lot of friends, and they're all meant to work together as a beautiful team. But if max is weak because you've been sitting on him for decades, and he has no strength, if he's atrophied, if he's shrunk, if he's lost size and strength, you're pretty much guaranteed you're gonna have some back issues. If you don't have back issues, you might have shoulder or neck issues because this is your power source. If you, if you go to sit down in a chair and you plop, you've got max deficiency, right? If you go to push open a, a heavy door and you struggle to push open the heavy door, it's max because every action has an equal and opposite reaction and you're pushing through the floor with your feet and max is, is providing the power for that as you're pushing open the door. Same thing when you go to get out of a car, when you squat down to get something out from under the sink, when you bend over to get something out of the trunk of the car, right? All of these require a very strong max. Now, as I said, everything does work together, but this is one of the most common, mostly unknown reasons people have back pain because of a, a weak power source. It's really not a good thing to have, right? Now I'm showing you here, here's Max a little bit more focused and here's the hamstrings and uh, they do work together because when you go to sit down, um, you know, that muscle gets longer and it controls that movement so that you don't plop if you need to put your hands behind you and hold on to sit down without plopping, then max is weak, right? If you need your arms to help you, if you need your arms to help you to get out of a chair, then you've got a weak power source, right? So, and the cool thing is, it doesn't matter how old you are, you can be 90, you can be 100, and you can get stronger. The, the body doesn't change on a cellular level in how it responds to doing the right things. It might slow down a little bit, depending. On, on your diet and your history and your medical history and all that stuff. But for the most part, no matter how old you are, you can get stronger. So that's the good thing. Uh, and, and when I was at conference, I, I presented Cy Perlis. Uh, I think I might've talked about that last month where you know he was 96, I think. And he, he broke the record on bench press for his age group. It was like 137 pounds. And uh, so it doesn't matter how old you are, right? And I think he was in his, he was in his 80s when he started competing and he was in his 60s when he started weight training. So age is not the definitive factor here, right? You just have to know what to do and how to do it safely. So I wanted everybody to see these muscles so they'd understand. And then not to get off on a tangent, but this is the latissimus dorsi muscle. And this is, if I go back, um, you can see it here, right? So it's a great big back muscle. And this great big back muscle here, you can see it attaches to the front of the sacrum, which is that upside down triangle that's at the bottom of the spine. And it also attaches up here in the front of the shoulder bone, the humerus. And so if you've got anything going on in the sacrum, 
Maybe you were sitting at a red light and you got rear-ended um, and because your foot was on the brake, the, it created this torque in, this, in the pelvis. And so your sacrum might actually have um, a torsion happening, which is a very small thing. You wouldn't really see it on x-ray. You can only really find it by palpating somebody who's trained and looking for this stuff. And um, what that would do is that would kind of pull on this muscle. And when, the, when a muscle gets pulled on abnormally, it pulls back, it creates this low level tug of war. So now it's gonna be creating some tension that's abnormal up at the shoulder. So now every time this person goes to move that arm, that arm is not properly aligned because the lat dorsi is pulling on it. So, and I know this isn't, you know, I'll be talking about shoulders at some point in one of the months that we connect, but I wanted to show this because you might not have back pain, you might have shoulder pain, but your shoulder pain may be because your back has something going on with it mechanically, right? So understanding the anatomy and finding somebody who looks at you as a whole person and doesn't see you as a, as a body part that walks through the door is key. Can't tell you how many people I've helped with shoulder pain by correcting what was going on in the low back or in the, the trunk or, or elsewhere. So um, it's really, really key to understand that. So, and then of course, you know, the, the whole lack of physical exercise continues, especially if we're, you know, we've got really weak abdominal muscles or a weak core. And it's not just about your abs, your core is actually from your nose to your toes. Um, if you've got really tight back muscles, I mean, everything is just out of balance here, right? Weak max, max is just not working right. The hip flexors, because of all the sitting, get all tight and they pull on the lumbar spine. So it's really important that we work to have functional strength. We want to restore this normal pain-free movement by re-establishing normal movement patterns, not abnormal ones. And I've talked about this in the times that I've been here. A lot of the machines we use at the gym are abnormal movement patterns. They're not what we would ever do in real life. They're not what the body was designed to do. Yes, it can do it, but it's not, it's not authentic movement. So you want to teach your body to move properly under load. And, and so now what happens is you end up with a nice pain-free low back function in the ways that you live your life. That, that's how we want to train. And I want to show, you know, there's, I, you know, I didn't want to show slide after slide after slide after slide, but there's four different references here that show that there is a real lack of correlation between what shows up on imaging and experiencing low back pain. And a lot of the times chronic low backs are, are um, symptoms or pain is blamed on things that are seen on imaging. But consistently it's been shown, whether it's an X-ray, a CAT scan, an MRI, that the presence of these things, a bulging disc, a subluxation, a scoliosis, arthritis changes, pinched nerves, et cetera, appears unrelated to whether or not somebody experiences chronic pain. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. You might be somebody who's got a serious herniated disc and you're at risk of developing foot drop and you better run to a neurosurgeon, right? But that's rare. A lot of the times what shows up on imaging is not the reason the person has pain. The reason the person has pain is because they have a weak power source or their, their psoas, their hip flexors are locked so short that when they go to stand up, they can't lengthen and allow them to stand up straight because they're yanking on their lumbar spine and causing pain. So none of that's gonna show up on any of the imaging, but something else might show up and then they just think, well, that must be why you've got pain, but it may have nothing to do with it. So it's really important that we don't count on a diagnostic test to be the end all be all definitive diagnosis. We wanna make sure we're looking at, at other things and being sure that before we agree to a procedure or a surgery, we've addressed the other potentials that are not invasive, right? Mostly benefit and no harm. So, all right. So these are your common diagnoses and I'm not gonna teach on each one of these. I just wanted you to see these. SI dysfunction is pretty common. Um, you know, that's your sacroiliac joint. If you put your hands on your hips, your thumbs will kind of land where those SI joints are. If you think of a baby um, backside without a diaper on, it's where those dimples are just above the butt cheeks. Um, you know, that's your SIs. Um, and that joint does have some mobility in it, and it can really create um, 
a lot of pain in the body if there's things that are wrong. You've got 28 muscles that go into the pelvis. If any of those are not playing nice, that can create pain in the SI joints. Uh, piriformis syndrome, that's a really deep muscle in the buttock. It goes diagonal across the buttock and attaches to the outside of the hips. Um, it's a literal pain in the butt. Those, that's those people who want to push their fist right up into their butt. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, again, that could be because of a sacral torsion because the piriformis attaches to the sacrum too. And if it's torqued, it'll pull on the piriformis. And again, as I said, when you pull on a muscle, it pulls back. It's like a tug of war. And then sciatica, you know, that can, that pain down the leg, the sciatic nerve, that can be happening because of pressure at the nerve root. That could be happening because the piriformis is squeezing it. Um, you know, that could be for, for some different reasons. Um, and then disc herniations, low back pain, muscle spasms, even hip or knee pain can be because of back issues, right? And then positional pain. That means it always hurts when I sit or it always hurts when I lay on my left side. And transitional pain, that means when you're changing position. So it always hurts when I go to sit, but once I sit, I'm okay. Or it always hurts when I go to stand up, but once I stand up, I'm okay. It's that transition, right? That's transitional pain. So those are some common diagnoses. Now, as far as treatment goes, uh, we want to make sure we're lifting properly. We want to make sure our ergonomics is healthy, right? But remember, we've got to be getting up regularly, but educating the person about these things, making sure that their workspace is good, making sure that lifting is good, making sure things are going the way they're supposed to be going for the human anatomy. And then we've got things like correcting alignment and biomechanics. And I wanted to share these because um, a lot of people who are watching this may be completely unaware that there are professionals, there are healthcare experts, who clinicians who are trained in specific methods and techniques that are extremely effective at addressing these issues. One of them is muscle energy technique. I highly recommend this. That is what this person is performing here up in the top left and also on the bottom left, that's muscle energy technique. There's another technique called Mulligan's mobilization with movement, and that's extremely effective as well. And that's what this person's performing up here using this belt. So there are some phenomenally effective methods and techniques out there. It's a matter of finding somebody who's skilled in performing them. And then this bottom right is the McKenzie's method. And this is mostly a hands-off, but you really do want to be working with somebody who's certified in McKenzie as a classification system. Um, and you need to be classified. You know, if you've got a posterior derangement, you need to know how to handle that and how to, but, but it's phenomenally effective, especially in addressing disc issues. So these things could potentially, you know, save people from procedures and surgeries and, and years of pain. They can be really, really effective. So I wanted people to know about these. These are some of my favorite things uh, to use with people. And then, of course, we do want to be reestablishing functional movements, right? You want to be able to be doing a squat where you're loading max and he's working well. Even if you've got decreased stability, you can hang on so you're safe. You want to make sure those knees are back. You want to be loading the right muscles. Here's a way to really load that right hip. Uh, really effectively. Um, he, you know, it doesn't matter how old you are. This person can be doing step ups and loading max and, and, and getting function back in the body, right? So lots of things, of course, the things you do are, are going to be dictated by what you're experiencing. And this, you know, it's not possible for me here to, to work with anybody individually. I'm, I'm trying to give general information that may help you to ask more informed questions of the people that you work with. So we want to eliminate back pain, right? And as a conclusion here, diet is powerful. Don't forget it. I talked about this last month, right? And I love this quote from Dr. Hoffer. If a patient's been to more than four physicians, nutrition's probably the medical answer, right? And, and remember this, diet, exercise, and weight loss can reduce or even eliminate pain. And ask yourself, what's your goal? Do you want relief of the pain or do you want resolution of the cause of the pain? And this is just a little reminder. I am teaching this this week. Today was day two. It is recorded. It's not too late if you want to join. This is the link here. And we'd be happy to have you join us 
I've got, I don't know, 540 people registered, something like that. Um, it's, um, it's my way to get this information out there. It's completely free. So uh, that said, I now would love to show some movements and, um, and do a little bit of exercise with people if they're, if they're open to that. We would love it. And there's a couple of questions that were submitted in advance. Would you like to take them now or after you show the movements? I'm going to take them now before we Sure, them. great. Well, we love when people send them in in advance. Thank you. Yes. And we appreciate it. They're not necessarily on back pain, but they're still good questions. And the first one is from Heidi. She says uh, she read your wonderful article in the new issue of Health Science Magazine and would like to ask you, how does one find a good physical therapist for an elderly parent who is active but showing signs of sarcopenia? In your article, you described an 88-year-old woman who broke her leg after falling off a ladder while cleaning slow off, snow off her roof. It reminded me, it reminded me of my own feisty, active 80-year young mother who recently had a bad fall but thankfully didn't break anything except her confidence. How do I help her find a physical therapist who will not treat her like an old woman, but rather someone with potential to take on properly programmed progressive resistance training and make gains in her strength and stamina? Similar to how there are now online lists of whole food plant-based doctors nationwide, are there some resources to find someone just like you, Eileen? Yeah. So Heidi, I could hug you. I love the fact that you see we need to be treating people based on their abilities, not their age, right? I mean, I've worked in nursing home settings, home care settings, you know, uh, I've worked with a lot of young athletes. I've worked in pretty much every population there is. And I've had people over hundred years old doing squats in the parallel bars. So I'll never forget, I had this one guy, I went to his room, he'd had, he'd had a hip replacement and he was grumpy to beat the band. He was barking at me and, 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 um, he said, yeah, you're just going to have me straighten in my knee. How's that going to help me? I said, why would I have you do that? And he's looking at me. I said, you want to work? Come on. I brought him down to the gym. I got him in the parallel bars. He was huffing and puffing. And, and I don't want to say hurting, but he was worked. And I'll tell you, he had a grin on his face from ear to ear because he wanted to get home. And he wanted to go back to the way his life was before he had that surgery. He didn't want to end up being some decrepit old man. So, and I don't say that to be disrespectful, but nobody wants to end up like that, right? And, and you've heard me say this, AJ, nobody ever set a goal to go to a nursing home, right? You end up there by default. Nobody wants to be there, right? So I love Heidi, you, you, you're, you are, your mom is blessed to have you as a daughter. So, so let me say this. The, the best thing to do would be to ask questions, obviously, right? Do a little interview, find out. Um, you, you don't want to bring somebody who's specifically, like you said, going to see her as an old person and have her sit in a chair, right? And, and, and do this and do this. Yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much useless, right? So, you know, you want somebody who's going to work her. Um, what might be good, and this is just an off the cuff suggestion, the Gray Institute is an amazing organization that trains healthcare professionals in applied functional science, which is three plane movement and authentic movement. And they um, keep track of who's certified in AFS. So what I would recommend is that you contact the Gray Institute and it's G-R-A-Y, and I think it's grayinstitute.com is their website. And um, just contact them. Their phone number's at the bottom of the page. Just call them and find out who in my area is trained in applied functional science. You find somebody there who's certified in it, you're gonna find somebody who's gonna work her body properly. And, and they're gonna know how to help her without hurting her, obviously. Um, but yeah, you're right. She, she just needs to get her confidence back. Falling can create some lack of confidence and a little bit of fear of that happening again. And, um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot that can be done and feel free to contact me if, if, you know, use me as a resource. Um, if you struggle to find somebody, you know, we'll put our heads together and see what we can figure out to help her. Can you work with her mother virtually, or is there some benefit to also having an in-person physical therapist when you can? Um, well, depending on her safety level, uh, typically if somebody is a little unstable and they're older, I prefer to have a family member in the room kind of monitoring them if I work with them on Zoom. I have done that many times. 
Um, but if her balance is pretty good and she's not at risk of falling from doing movements and things, yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot that can be done over Zoom. Absolutely. That's great. Maybe even just a consult. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. And this is a question from Sue. Eileen, my 26-year-old son has cerebral palsy. Did I hear you mention on a previous show the name of a doctor who helps folks with cerebral palsy move better? If so, how can I contact him or access his program? So I, if my memory serves me correctly, what you probably heard me mention was Moje Feldenkrais. And that's spelled F-E-L-D-E-N-K-R-A-I-S. Now, he's no longer living, but he has established a method of training and movement that works very well for um, what most people experience. CP is very unique and individual. Some are extremely restricted in their movements and some not so much, right? It depends on, on how, how much they were impacted during birth. So um, if you, I believe the, um, there is the Feldenkrais Institute. Um, I believe you could contact them and maybe find somebody in your area who's trained in that. And that would probably be very helpful for you. Right. Thank you. Well, those were all the questions that were submitted in advance. I mean, I mean, we could look at the chat, I suppose, but I'm so busy watching you. But I did see one about a it really helps, guys, when you put those four question marks in advance so that I can differentiate a question from a comment. But I did see one, but it's uh, it's been a while. Let's see, it was on something. Well, here's a nice comment, though. Eileen's back master class is great, says Gina. I'm learning so much. The uh, the exercises are doable. Is can low back pain involve pelvic issues? Asks Andrea. Yeah. So. Pelvic issues, I have a whole course on that. Um, pelvic issues, because of the, the muscles that are in the, in the, it's really a pelvic bowl. We call it a floor, but it's really like a bowl that you're looking down in, right? Um, but we'll just call it a floor for, for simplicity's sake. And so that pelvic floor has uh, the biggest, the most important muscle that's supporting everything is the levator ani. And that muscle needs to have this um, tension that kind of comes forward toward the pubic bone and up toward the head to keep everything where it belongs, right? To create that, to, to keep the bladder where it belongs and, and, and the uterus and all of those organs. Uh, if you're a male, you know, it's the prostate and, and all of that. So what happens is if you lack um, a lot of function going on in the hips and you might not even be aware of it, especially if you've had a lot of kids, um, what happens is the, the weakness occurs in that muscle. It no longer holds that nice tension and supports everything. And as the bladder gets heavier, it'll pull down and now you get that unwanted leakage. Um, there's also pelvic pain that can occur because of that abnormal tension. Um, sometimes there's too much tension, right? So um, there's, there's a beautiful method. And again, I'll mention this, and this isn't me selling anything because I don't sell it but it's called the Pelvic Core Pro. And you can find it at pelvicsolutions.com. And that is Christina Christie. She is a graduate of the fellowship program of the Gray Institute. She has spent decades, like her entire career working in women's health. And she is extremely knowledgeable about pelvic issues. And she designed this device and it's really inexpensive. I think it's like 60 bucks. So we're not talking, you know, mega bucks here. And it's designed so that you can do exercises with resistance that wakes up and works all of those muscles in a three plane functional way that gets the pelvic floor to be reestablished in a healthy function. So, um, and it's, you do it all clothed right on your feet. So uh, no weird exercises with weighted cones or, um, uncomfortable internal work. It's, uh, it's, it's really user-friendly and, and it can be very, very helpful. Great. Thank you. Uh, Struthi says, could you elaborate on hernias? I have abdominal hernia. Well, hernias, there's different ones. There's inguinal, of course, there, there's, you know, uh, there, there's, di there's different ones. A hernia is when something is not, there's excess stress in that area and it's side of kind of gone through the structures that it's not supposed to go through. So 
everybody's different. There's really not a lot I can say on that that would really be beneficial for you. I would seek a healthcare professional because hernias can get what's called strangulated. And that's when things become pretty dangerous and life-threatening. So it's important to have it assessed um, and to make sure, but you know, there's a weakness going on depending on where it is in the abdominal wall. Um, and so there are some different strategies, but you really need to know, I think getting independent, like one-on-one -on -one consultation is better. And I'm not saying consult with me, but you know, work with somebody that you know what you're doing is right for you. So thank you. And Angie says, who should I go to to uh, to diagnose a back injury? Or yeah, that's what the question is. Well, that's that's a pretty broad question. Um, you know, that injury could be pretty severe. You might have a fracture. You might have right. So you've got a really. Um, did you have a really bad fall? Did something? So I'm not really sure how to answer that appropriately and safely. Um, I know that most states have direct access to physical therapy. Um, you know, there are some therapists out there who know next to nothing. It's like any profession. And then there's other therapists out there who, you know, I want to be like them when I grow up because they're so skilled and experienced and they help so many people. So it's really kind of the luck of the draw, unless you make some phone calls, finding out, you know, if there's pain going down the leg, if there's any radicular pain, I would highly recommend finding somebody certified in McKenzie, because that's going to be more effective. Um, but, uh, but yeah, most PT clinics have direct access and, and they, no matter what they're training, they should be able to know if you should seek medical attention by assessing you. And then at least you've kind of saved that middleman. If they can help you, you're there and you can get helped, right? So, right. but I recommend finding somebody who knows those techniques I mentioned earlier in those slides. Yeah, how do you feel about chiropractors? I mean, Dr. Goldhammer's one, he's fantastic. Yes, and I think it's like any other profession. There's great ones and there's not so great ones, right? right. You, I you don't want to, yeah, you, you don't want a chiropractor who tells, oh, you got to come in three times a week because L5 keeps rotating and I just have to keep adjusting you until you're, you know, below ground. I mean, that's, that's not a good chiropractor, right? So, um, yeah, you want somebody who's really going to do their best to to get you well and send you on your way, not to necessarily make you dependent on them every week, every month, whatever. And there's different schools of chiropractic, right? There's the chiropractic who thinks everything happens at the OA joint. And if they adjust you there, that's going to fix your knee pain. Not necessarily. That's not what I've seen in my, my years of practice. So um, yeah, it's like anything else. There's there's good and not so good. And Great. Fantastic. And there's a question from Ruby. What do you think about Birkenstock sandals? Toe grip in those sandals. And I wondered about it when you discussed flip-flops. Yeah, they're not quite the same as a flip-flop because they're not necessarily going to fall off your feet. Um, I haven't done a lot of research on, on Birkenstock and, and how that impacts any kind of pain or back pain. I don't even know if there's been any research done on that, to be honest with you. Um, I do know that unless you need orthotics or or you have some serious foot structural issue, going barefoot now and then is a really good idea uh, because the, the you know you got four layers of muscles in your feet. And I've heard some experts say that shoes are kind of like coffins for your feet because they don't allow the muscles to really work the way they're they're designed to. So, coffins. That's funny. <laughs> isn't that funny? I love yeah. it. Yeah. So, and it's true, right? And and I don't know, you know, do an internet search. I remember watching a young woman who could do everything with her feet. She changed her baby's diaper with her feet. Oh my God, I saw that today. I, and she was doing dishes. She had no arms. I, I couldn't yeah. believe it. Yeah, it going shopping down the aisle, pushing the cart with her chest and her foot goes up and grabs things off the shelf. And I mean, it's just incredible changing her baby's shirt. I mean, oh my goodness. It, it was mind blowing. But it shows what our feet are capable of doing, right? because of all those layers of muscles. The only difference between your foot and your hand is your big toe doesn't have opposition like your thumb does. That's the only difference. So those feet can do phenomenal things. If you're constantly in shoes, those muscles, they'll weaken over time, right? Atrophy a little bit, so yeah. Wow, okay, oh, I think I saw one more in the chat. Um, Rebecca says, have you ever heard of the soul seat chair? It's a backless seat that allows you to sit in various ways, including cross-legged. And what is your opinion? 
But I think just generally speaking, there is no perfect chair. It's nice that it allows you to change positions, but ideally you want to be getting up consistently. We are just not meant to sit in a prolonged, for a prolonged period of time. It's just, no matter what you're sitting on, you're still sitting on max, you're sitting on your hamstrings, you're compressing the connective tissue, you're compressing the muscles, doesn't matter what you're sitting on, you got to get up regularly. So that's really key. There are people who have standing desks now and they're just having different pain than those who sit because they're standing still all day, right? Cashiers have the same problem. So you got to move. We're designed for movement. Yeah. Motion is lotion. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, please compare pelvic that was just talked about versus the sock that Chef AJ demonstrated for incontinence. I don't know. I never saw the sock, but I can show you. I think I've got it here my pelvic core pro, I can show you what this looks like. And I don't sell these. So I'm, I'm not trying to, to market. And, and I don't sell the sock and I don't get anything yeah. if they buy it. I just, yeah, yeah. I, I don't just get anything if people yeah. buy this either. I just yeah. know that it really works really well. So this is the pelvic core pro. I've not seen the sock AJ. So you'll have, I don't know. You probably don't have it next to you and you can show um, it. And it's in the other room, but it's a neural. I had the, I had the inventor from Israel on the show. It's a neural modulation device. So instead of going to the doctor every week for PTNS, which is percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, you do it. Oh, your- yes. Down at the ankle, yes. Yeah, yes. you know yes. about it then, cool. Okay, I know I know about that, yeah. And, and that's one of the things that I'll teach, and I'll lower this. When I teach people what you can do to, um, like if you're having urgency or whatever, if you do this, that helps to calm the urgency and gives you a little more time before. And, and if you've ever, you might've instinctively done this when you're sitting at a conference and you're waiting for the break to go use the bathroom, right? You're just kind of doing this. You don't even know why you're doing it. That can stimulate those nerves as well. But this is to work the muscles. So this is the difference. You put this on and it works really, really well because it stays where it belongs. And so now what I can do is I can work to push out, which is working the external rotators of my hip. And I so I've got that resistance, right? And I can push in, which is resisting and working the internal rotators. And there's, there's like no end to things you can't do with this. I mean, you can do there, you squats and squeeze in and push out. I mean, it just, it's a beautiful device. It's simple in design, but extremely well-made and, um, and so easy to put on and off. It's like literally seconds. And, and I teach a four week class in this with lots of different classes, but, um, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And how, do you know about approximately how much that uh, device costs? It's about $60. Oh, that's very affordable. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Nice. Uh, Linda says, what about OOFOS clogs? Um, I don't know. Is she asking, are they good? To, I'm not quite sure what her question is, what she wants to know. Yeah. Okay. I'm not maybe familiar maybe, with that footwear. Maybe she's thinking clogs. Maybe be more specific if you can. Uh, do you have an opinion on glucosamine supplements for bone health? So glucosamine is usually joined with chondroitin. Um, I do know that uh, I attended a course, and I always forget exactly what it is. I think I've got it right here, if I'm not mistaken. Um, no, this isn't the right one. I'd have to look it up. There's um, There was some studies that were done and it was a specific type of chondroitin that had more effectiveness than another type. And um, I had it right here, but now I'm not sure where it went. Oh, here it is. Good, good, good. You would think I was unorganized, right? Um, glucosamine sulfate, not hydrochloride was found in the studies to be more effective. And whether or not it had chondroitin really had no effect. So um, that was the latest study that um, that was presented. And this was presented by a, a, a research scientist at a Principles of Managing Pain non-drug interventions uh, event, so. Thank you. Uh, Randy says, after having surgery for hammer toes, my toes are so straight, they don't move or wiggle. Doing yoga is hard because toes cramp into a claw. If foot is backwards, are there any exercises you recommend? 
I would recommend the melt method. It's uh, M-E-L-T, kind of like an ice cube melts, right? Meltmethod.com. Um, they have a hand and foot kit. I would highly recommend that because that is going to help to hydrate, decompress the joints in the feet. Um, there's some great techniques and strategies with that treatment that you might find very beneficial. And the best thing is there's no potential harm, only potential benefit. So I feel very confident recommending that. Great. Oh, I saw something. There's so many questions when we have you on. Uh, Karen says, regarding the pelvic core, there are two types, regular and one for someone who's more athletic. I think I'm looking at the latter for me and wondering what your thoughts are on the two models. Yeah. So the red one is for those who are a little bit more sedentary, the silver for those who are a little more athletic. Um, unless you're really sedentary and, and really um, declined in abilities, I would recommend the silver. Okay. Um, I, I Googled OOFOS and it looks like it's some kind of a clog. And Linda said, are they good to wear all day like she does? Yeah. So, I mean, I do know from being in the medical world, a lot of nurses love to wear clogs. It's a, it's a very popular choice of shoes for nurses. So I'm assuming that's because they're comfortable. I never cared for them. I've tried wearing them and I didn't, they just felt like these big stiff, um, and it just reminded me of these big putting on these pieces of wood on my feet or something. I just, I never found them comfortable at all. I think it's a matter of preference, really. Um, I, I've not looked at any data that shows one way or the other as far as clogs. Yeah, I like the only shoe that I ever found comfortable was a, a tennis shoe called Asics, and I just love them. Asics, yeah, yeah. that's a popular brand. Yeah, I, I just, think that might be what I'm. No, that's not what I'm wearing. My other ones feel, really feel so comfortable to me. I, I, in what, not, not today, but in, in any of your future talks, will you cover plantar fasciitis and what to do for it? And oh, I would be happy this? to. Yeah. Yeah. Because that, that we get a lot of questions about that. And one of the viewers threw her back out and like, what should I do? Says Julie. I, I'd say yeah. go to the doctor, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't know what happened. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what's going on. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Sherry says, what causes extreme painful calf cramps? Well, cramps are, you know, you could be dehydrated. There could be a, a, a magnesium, calcium issue going on, um, you know, lack of one, too much of another kind of thing. Um, cramps are, you know, a lot of the times it's dehydration. People don't realize it. Yeah. So, uh, and then sometimes it's just that there's a real imbalance in the muscles. I, I remember, I'll never forget this. I had a colleague who said, that he used to suffer from calf cramps when he went to bed. And he tried just for curiosity, giggle sake, he tried stretching his calves before he went to sleep and he didn't have any cramps when he slept. It was the first time. So sometimes it, it's a simple solution. It's an easy thing to try. Um, so that might help. But a lot of times it's dehydration. Great. Well, if you're ready, I'd love to see your exercises. Okay. I will head downstairs. While I'm you head downstairs, here. I'll talk to the Thank troops for a minute and okay. tell them what's coming up on Chef AJ Live. So if you're subscribed to chefaj.com, I send you an email every week telling you who the guests are so you can easily ask your questions. And at 2 p.m. today, we have a bonus show with Dr. Natalie Gentili. She's a plant-based doctor, and she's going to be talking about how she cured her disordered eating with a whole food plant-based diet. And tomorrow, we our show is earlier. Wednesday and Sundays are earlier at 9 o'clock, except for when it's Dr. Rogers. We start at 8 o'clock because he talks a lot. And tomorrow is Dr. Gupta, and he's going to be talking about thyroid health and why some people may have difficulty losing weight. So I hope you'll tune in, and I do hope you'll subscribe to my channel so I can get to 200,000. Thank you so much. And now back to Eileen in the gym. All right. 200,000. Yes, yes, yes. That sounds pretty exciting. Okay. You can see me all right, right? Perfect. Okay. Um, I don't know if you need to change view or something. I'm just seeing small. Am I doing the wrong view here? Uh, I'll, no, you're fine. I'll, I'll spotlight sure, you. Okay. Here you go. You're spotlighted. Okay. So. Oh, good. Thank you. That way I can see me when I can see oh, what sure. I'm doing. No problem. No problem. <laughs> Instead of trying to, I'd have to go up and get my glasses. What am I doing? <laughs> All right. So um, if you were with us last month and you saw part one of this, I taught a really basic way to start mobilizing your low back from below, 
right? So from the ground up, you can also mobilize your back from the top down. I'm gonna show a little more of that today, but let me sort of remind you what we did the last time. Even if you were here, it might be a good review. We did a very simple hip matrix. And remember a matrix is any time that you move in all three planes of motion. So we did a little forward and back. And we told you if a movement hurt, you didn't do it. You only did the movements that did not hurt. And when you do that repetitively and there's no pain and it's successful, your body builds on that success and you start to see increased mobility. So this is the forward and back. We also had the side to side, kind of like if you were standing in parallel bars and you were tapping with your hips, let your upper body move. It's not, it's not this, right? It's the whole body kind of goes as your hips are going side to side, again, only doing movements that do not hurt and building on that success. And then we did rotation. And then for those of you who were game and this was okay for you, we added some arm motion and a little more whole body motion. So we kind of did a little squat reaching down at chair height. So if you have a chair in front of you, it kind of gives you a good target. So we did a little down and then we did up and back. It's almost like you're doing sort of like a, a, a worship movement, right? And then you can do side to side with the arms up. And when the arms are up, you're getting a little more motion. Whenever your arms are moving, you're mobilizing your trunk, which is between your neck and your low back. And what I wanted to do today was to share with you a couple of things you can do for your trunk, because a lot of the times, if that's kind of stuck and not moving, it can hurt the low back. If you struggle to turn to back up your car, it's probably your trunk, even though you get the pain in your back, right? Because your trunk is designed to rotate, your low back is not. If you remember me saying that the last time, the low back is really good at bending forward and backward, it's not designed anatomically to do a lot of rotation. I think depending on what book you look at, it's up to only like 13 degrees of rotation, which isn't very much, right? Because if this is zero and this is 90, 13 is, is not very much rotation. So you're not getting a lot of movement in that range, but the trunk really rotates well. The hips really rotate well. So that's where the rotation is supposed to be happening from right? So we had you mobilize from below. We did this, we did this, and we did this. And this is kind of a warm up to getting your trunk to rotate really well. So I thought what I would do today is show you a couple of things that will sort of mobilize from the top down and get that trunk moving. And so I'd like to show you a couple of things in sitting because there are some of you who are um, maybe not real good up on your feet. And I know we're trying to get you not sitting all the time, but when you do this in sitting, what happens is because you're sitting on your hips, your sits bones, your, your hips are gonna move less, which means you're gonna get a little more motion in your trunk. It kind of has to do it because the hips aren't really helping. So it'll really help to mobilize from above. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some reaching. And whenever your arm moves, your shoulder blade is moving on the ribs. You're getting a lot more mobility in the upper thoracic spine, which tends to, you know, especially if you've kind of got that forward motion happening and, and you don't want to get that that hunch back there. You really want to get the shoulders up as much as you can. Right. So doing a lot of arm movement would be your friend. It also allows you to really mobilize your trunk, which is going to help your low back be happy. And this is another one of those mostly unknown causes of low back pain is trunk motion impairment. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with, we want to do all three planes of motion. So the first thing we're going to do is you're going to reach straight up. And so I taught this this morning in my academy class. So my body's all warmed up for this. But what you're going to do is you're going to reach up. And what I want you to think about is if there was like a balloon there, you're trying to poke your fingers into or through the balloon. So you get to the part where the balloon is, and then you're trying to push your fingers into that, right? So you're getting that extra, that, that scapula, that shoulder blade is really gliding on the back there, which is really mobilizing your trunk. And of course, we're going to do both sides, right? So you want to just reach up, 
and get that extra movement and then reach up and get that extra movement. And you can do it two or three times, just really going for it. Now we want to add a little bit to it so you can reach over your head. So now I'm going to reach across my head, which puts me into a nice side bent position. And again, I'm at the end, I'm trying to reach through that balloon. And then I'm doing the same thing here, trying to reach through that balloon. And you can do that a couple of times, really getting that end range going up into that, right? Now we're going to add a little bit of rotation. So for first, I'm going to go forward right at shoulder height, and I'm going to do like a cross punch. So my right arm is going to go here. So it's like I'm rotating left. And again, I'm really reaching to try to put my fingers through that balloon. And it's not like I'm bending forward and trying to do that. The reach is coming from my shoulders, really trying to get through that. So I just go to my end and then I really give that added reach, really mobilizes and adds this beautiful kind of a fluid fill effect in all those muscles around the spine. And then we'll do the same thing backward. A lot of the times this part of our body really sort of shortens and closes up, right? So if I reach behind me, I'm opening up the whole pec wall and I'm really, again, trying to reach and trying to reach. And I'll tell you, the academy students this morning kept telling me that their neck never felt better and they couldn't believe how much looser they were. And uh, they, they were raving about this one. And then you, again, reach. So you do it two or three times. And you really go for that. And now we're going to do a little bit of a diagonal. So this will be the last move we'll do, but we're going to do it forward and back. So say... I had a big rectangle in front of me and I'm trying to reach up to that top left corner with my right hand. So I'm diagonal and I'm up and I'm doing that last little bit of extra, right? Just feeling that lift go on, really lifting those ribs up. And then of course we wanna do that behind, same thing, that big rectangle, I'm going for that corner, it's a diagonal corner, and I'm trying to reach, and I'm trying to reach, and I'll do that again, and again. So what you've just done is really mobilized your trunk. There's a lot more things you can do. Hopefully, um, no one's getting the idea that I'm saying, you know, just do this one exercise and you're great for life. These are, these are kind of introductions. These are starting points. These are great ways to just start to train your body in three-plane function. But better understanding when you go to do exercises, when you go to do workouts, that you'll see, wow, that workout just has me doing one plane of motion. I'm just doing the same thing. But yeah, I mean, it just gets you to start thinking and you're going to you're going to notice movement more. But just I'd be, love to hear, AJ, if anybody says that, you know, they feel looser, their neck feels better just from doing that. And of course, you can do more repetitions, right? Nice. There's a question from Judy, if rotations are OK for people with osteoporosis. So rotations aren't necessarily dangerous for osteoporosis per se. What tends to be more unsafe is forward flexion. It depends on where the osteoporosis is, for one thing. If it's in their spine, typically it's the very front of the vertebral body that um, is at risk when they bend forward of, of crushing that anterior body of the vertebral spine and they end up with a compression fracture in the spine. That tends to be more dangerous for that. Uh, you know, like, so like tying your shoes or bending over and trying to open a, a window that gets stuck, that kind of thing. Usually, you know, most people that have got osteoporosis, their healthcare professionals hopefully are telling them what's safe and what's not safe, so. Great. Randy wants to know if you're in Columbus, Ohio, and if you are or wherever you are, do you actually see people in person ever? I do go to Columbus every year for a conference and I'll be in and I'll be in Cincinnati in June at the NHA conference. Um, and when I'm there, um, not at this particular conference, um, but usually when I'm there, I do I do work with people. I am licensed in Ohio. 
to um, to do perform physical therapy services. I'm licensed in Ohio and New York State, so I have done that. Yes. Nice. Well, great. Do you know what body part or body parts we're going to uh, discover next month? I don't know. Is there any request? Anybody want to write in the chat? I'm, well, I, I like I like plantar fasciitis. I mean, just because okay. I hear from people like, you know, it's it's one of those things. It's not life threatening, but it can be really, you know, difficult for people to do their exercise and even just walking with it, you know. All right. All right. So you have just inspired me, AJ. My next event, I wasn't sure what I wanted to teach. I think what I'll do in my next event is um, to walk without pain. And fasciitis is a big part of that. So that yes, I'm excited. I wasn't sure what I was going to teach. Thank you. That's great. That's a great one. Well, thank you. This is it's always fun learning from you. You're really great at what you do. I appreciate you coming on every month. Uh, well, Suzanne I saying knee lucky. pain, but I, I could have sworn we did knee pain. And Janet's saying foot and ankle. Well, plantar fasciitis is the foot. So people, you know, you've got a lot. You've got, I think there's like 216 bones in the body. So you'll, you'll be able to figure something out <laughs> what to talk about. And, and not to mention all those muscles too. Yes. And everything is connected to everything else. So a lot of things do connect. Yes. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Eileen. Thank you. I love yeah. being here. Um, same here. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in about 90 minutes to meet a new plant-based doctor, Dr. Natalie Gentili. Take care, everyone.